Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Sounds like it. All right, so uh, thanks for uh, joining me today. Really happy to, to be here, to be able to participate in this event. This is the first time for me uh, at a Phosphor G conference. Um, as you can see, my name is Matt Lord. I'm a product manager in the MySQL group at Oracle. If you're not familiar with the uh, history, uh, MySQL, the independent company, was bought by Sun Microsystems, and then Sun Microsystems was bought by Oracle, and that, so that's how uh, I ended up at Oracle. And uh, a, a lot of people were a bit nervous about that uh, relationship initially, but as, uh, one, as someone who's been through um, you know, MySQL as an independent company, as part of Sun and as Oracle, uh, they've been a great steward uh, for the product, and they've been a, a, a great company uh, to work with. So. Um, I'm really happy about that. Um, I've been, been with MySQL for about 12 years. I started off in the training team, then consulting, and then support, and then product management. And personally, I come from a, a Unix um, system administration, DBA background, so uh, Solaris, Linux, um, a little bit of HPUX and AIX thrown in there for fun, and IRIX even. Um, and also Sybase, Oracle, and MySQL. So the GIS stuff is relatively new for me. And I'll talk about kind of the, the history on the MySQL side, uh, which was limited in the past. And, and then I'll, I'll talk about where we're at now, where we want to go in the future. So about uh, two years ago is when we, I, I moved into product management. And that's when we really started to make an investment. This is just a standard safe harbor statement big company like Oracle doesn't want to get sued, so it's basically just, hey, pay, please don't sue us. Um, anything that we talk about is you know, just informational purposes only, and yada, yada, yada. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. Again, just a history of MySQL's uh, spatial extensions, the current state. I'll walk through a very simple usage, usage example. It's about as simple as you can get. Uh, it's basically, if you're if you can take um, geometric points and assume that they're WGS84 um, long lat coordinate pairs um, and then using that with a Mercator projection. And then I'll talk about where we want to go um, in, the, in the future over the next uh, several years. But just a, a bit of the history first. So <coughs> we added initial spatial extensions in MySQL 4.1. So that was in early 2003, uh, but it was very limited. It was all uh, MBR based, so it was, we didn't have the SQL MM, uh, you know, ST underscore functions, which actually are, are more accurate because you're dealing with geometries. They were all MBR based, so uh, if you're dealing with points, it really doesn't make much of a difference, but if you're dealing with, you know, say you have two big lakes that are kind of L-shaped, um, the, the MBR is going to be much bigger than the actual um, geometry. So the distance and calculations and other things are, are, aren't going to be very accurate at all. And we also only had R tree indexes for the MyISAM storage engine. <coughs> so in, in MySQL, we have uh, a storage engine API. And MyISAM was the default at the time, but I definitely would not recommend using that today. InnoDB has been the default for many years now. And that's our MVCC ACID compliant storage engine. Uh, my ISAM is just a very small, lightweight uh, storage engine, but it doesn't, it doesn't support things that most people would expect uh, from a database engine today. You know, things like MVCC, things like uh, ACID compliance, automatic recovery, and so on. So that was very limited. But it was the first you know, major um, database that had spatial extensions in the FOSS space. I think there was a point release for PostGIS already by then. Uh, I think like 0 0.4 or 5 or something. But the 1.0 release candidate came out a couple of years later. And already with the 1.0 release, it had uh, a much richer feature set than MySQL did. Um, and it had the, you know, it had the SQL MM functions, the ST functions. And so it quickly took over the the GIS space and the mind share that MySQL had built up uh, before that. So for example, OpenStreetMap originally used MySQL as the, the database. 
to store all the data in. Uh, PostGIS uh, 1.0 came out and they pretty quickly switched over uh, to using PostGIS. And the same was true for uh, you know, the OSGO tools so like GDAL, um, OGR, and so on. And then in the kind of the adolescent years or the intermediate years, uh, PostGIS came out. The, of course, they had 1.1, one, 1.2, one, one, and so on, but 1.5 was the next big one uh, because they had a geography support. Well, they had a, a ton of other new features, but geography is, is just kind of, at least for me, is kind of one of those big milestones. You know, where you go from just having geometry support to being able to support geography. And part of that is kind of also, you know, CRS or coordinate reference system support. And during this adolescent period, there really w wasn't a lot happening on the MySQL side. So originally, the, the spatial extensions was done by this one guy, Alexei Bachkov. Um, and that was just kind of one thing he did. He wasn't uh, focused on GIS. He wasn't uh, you know, an expert in the domain. So it kind of sat, and it wasn't until MySQL 5.6 where we finally added the SQL MM spatial extension. So now you, at least you have the ST you know, uh, within, ST contains, ST intersects, ST buffer, and so on that you would expect, rather than just the old MBR-based uh, functions. And as I explained, those are going to be, you know, not only is it kind of standard naming conventions, but it's going to be much more accurate when you're doing the spatial analysis. But by 2012, uh, PostGIS just dominates the GIS market. That's what everybody's using. It's, it's by far and away the best, uh, the most feature-rich option that you have. And it's even when you're comparing it with the commercial databases, uh, like Oracle Spatial and Graph, um, DB2 has their uh, spatial extended, they call it. I don't know why they say extended instead of extensions, but, uh, and Microsoft SQL Server has their spatial extensions as well. But PostGIS is really, uh, it's kind of a stall within, within the, the GIS space. And almost, I think every presentation that I've gone to so far this week, they were using PostGIS. I think there may be one person who was using spatial light a little bit. Um, how many people here are using uh, PostGIS today? Okay, almost everybody. And how many people are using MySQL? And not it, for whatever purposes. Okay, a handful. So uh, uh, as I'll talk about, our initial goal is that for existing MySQL users or people who are thinking about it, so maybe you, your application is not a primarily a, a spatial application, but you have some uh, spatial component to it, or some particular aspect that's spatial. Maybe it's a, a store locator, or whatever the case may be. So we want to be able to provide a, a, an adequate uh, GI, spatial extensions and GIS for MySQL users, so that they can they don't need to stand up a separate uh, post GIS instance just to handle that the spatial aspect. And um, because it dominates the market, it's become the standard. So it was a de facto standard, and it's really set the bar for, um, for us in the MySQL side and what we would like to accomplish. So now uh, I'll talk about where we're at today. In the current, by the current state, I mean MySQL 5.7. And the reason I say that it's reborn is, you know, it was about two years ago. So remember, the original development was done by really one guy. He wasn't necessarily a domain expert. Um, he was just one of the one guy in the development team that was tasked with, you know, with that workload. Um, so we, at the product management level and at the development manager level, we have made a commitment to to invest in the uh, MySQL GIS because in the past we we'd focused on web, you know, the um, you know, LAMP, um, MySQL was just always available on any Linux distro for the most part. So it was very easy to get set up and running and start, you know, going off and doing your web development. But we realized that today and certainly in the coming years, every web development and certainly in mobile development, you're going to have some spatial component to just about every application. And the Internet of Things, of course, is, is on its way. Um, and even then, you know, everything's going to have to kind of be aware of its location on the network as well as on the physical earth. So we, we made a commitment to invest in it. Uh, one of the things we did was hire a, a full-time team of domain experts, and I'll talk about them uh, in the next slide. 
and I'll actually show a picture of, of who those people are. Uh, we decided to scrap most of the old code. So we had you know, the, all this old stuff that was from MySQL 4.1, and then some of the new algorithms that we added for the uh, SQL MM ex, um, spatial extensions in 5.6. So we, we faced the, a choice of either trying to kind of fix and expand on that existing code, or we could look for an existing open source library. Now, obvious, the obvious choice would be the same library that PostGIS is using. The only problem there is um, we dual license MySQL. So we have the GPL version, and then we have an enterprise or community version. And we do that so that, so let's say you, are, uh, you produce some hardware, and you want to bundle MySQL with it, so, but you don't want to open source that hardware. You can buy a commercial license. And we also have an enterprise um, version that has some additional extensions. So you get support. Um, there are some additional server plugins, like an audit plugin, a firewall plugin. And then we have uh, other tools built around it, like the enterprise monitor and, and enterprise backup and so on. So it's for that reason that we couldn't use, just simply use the same library. So the, the one that we found that was um, liberally licensed, but also offered a, a good base for us was Boost's Geometry. And I'll talk a little bit more about that next. So we started to rip out all the old code, all the old algorithms, and replace it by calls into Boost Geometry. And we're using uh, 158, which is the, the current development branch of Boost Geometry. And it, I saw it just went RC uh, today, I think. Uh, we also rounded out the, our uh, SQL MM support, so we're adding some functions that we didn't um, have before. Uh, standardizing the namespace, it was kind of a mess. We had like some were, had the ST prefix, some had no prefix, some had an MBR prefix. So just making it um, closer to what someone would expect if they were more of a domain expert. We added uh, geometry data type support to InnoDB. So remember that InnoDB is now this, uh, the default storage engine. It's what any you know, database expert is going to expect. It's MVCC ACID compliant storage engine. And we added uh, it, R-tree indexes to it as well. R-tree is just kind of the, uh, probably the, the most common spatial index. It's not the only one. Post just started with R-trees as well before moving to uh, a more general one with GIST, the gen our generalized search tree. We added GeoHash and GeoJSON support and some helper functions, and I'll talk a bit more about each of these. But this is the, the MySQL GIS team. So starting from the left, uh, we've got Benny, who's in, uh, uh, Shang or who's in Beijing, Norvald, who is in Norway. Uh, we've got David, who is in Shanghai, and then uh, We've got Menelaus, and he's one of the, the two people that work on Boost full-time. He works on Boost.geometry full-time. Man Yi is the team lead. And then Adam, he's the last, or he's the other Boost.geometry guy. So Adam and Menelaus work full-time on Boost Geometry, helping uh, to add things that we want or that we need, and then we uh, commit those upstream. And we actually have uh, Baron, who's the team lead, or I should say the, the project lead uh, for Boost Geometry. Uh, so if you go to the um, geometry page uh, or on boost.org, you'll see all three of them listed there. He's uh, also been doing uh, uh, consulting work for us. And then, uh, of course, there's me. I managed to squeeze my way into the picture there. But that was, uh, that was the team that we, we were able to form you know, once, we, we, once we realized um, one, that we wanted to get Boost, or wanted to use Boost, and then we went out and hired some people who had been working on it full time. Um, and we also got some more uh, domain experts on the, the database side. So uh, there's a good uh, synergy there within the team. So with Boost Geometry, again, I already kind of covered all of this. So we got a lot kind of for free, I guess you could say. We, we had a good starting point. So not only was it liberally, liberally licensed, but it was nicely written. Um, and it, it actually gave us, not in addition to OGC compliance, in, uh, as far as you know, how the uh, algorithms are, handle certain edge cases and so on, but it gave us a performance boost, which was kind of an unexpected surprise. 
I, I had always assumed that you know the old stuff wasn't very accurate, but we we were sacrificing accuracy for speed. But that didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, so we got a speed boost uh, on top of it. So that was really nice to see. Um, and spatial indexes. Again, I added these. Uh, th I don't know if this is really of interest to anybody. And let's see how we're doing on time. So the, the, the only difference really that I'll just go through quickly, if you're not familiar with um, how uh, spatial indexes work, this is just obviously a two-dimensional R tree. So basically you're, search, you're searching by a, a bounding box. So each index record has basically three entities. It has a min xy and a max xy th that it can use to represent the, uh, the minimum bounding rectangle. And then it has a pointer back to the actual uh, geometry. So typically, you would be searching, you know, say, hey, show me all, all or return all of the geometries that are within this box is, is a common one, or the intersects or touches and so on. Um, we also added geohash support. I don't know if anybody is familiar with geohash. Um, it happens to be the, the one type of index that uh, MongoDB's uh, GIS supports. It's, it's fairly limited, but it, it, it can be pretty effective in certain use cases. So if you're, for example, if you're doing exact lookups, um, it, can be, it can be really fast. The reason for that is that you can use a, a simple one-dimensional B-tree index with the geohash values. Because you have, you have a, uh, you encode and decode a hash. So you'd have a, a, string, a hash string, for example, U5KE7N1, uh, nine or whatever the case may be. So that, you, that gets decoded and you have a binary representation. So it's you know, n ones and zeros. And you just continue to slice the earth in half. So you have this Mercator projection. And so the first, um, the first one or zero, you, um, you slice it um, longitudinally, one zero, and then you slice it again latitudinally, one zero, and you just keep going back and forth. So the, the more um, bits you have, the more precision you can get. Uh, so if you're doing exact lookups, uh, it'll be very efficient. You can also kind of do quick and dirty proximity searches. Uh, I, because you can do, because the way the hashes are done, you can use a like with a percent. You know, so you just take off the last um, one or two characters in the hash string. The reason I say it's uh, kind of dirty uh, is because uh, the, w the way that it's done, where you're constantly slicing it in half, and you're 0 or 1, 0 or 1, if the two points are kind of on r really close to each other, but they're on either side of that slice, then they're not going to show up in the uh, proximity search. So it's, a, you know, it's, it's another kind of similar problem that you have with um, the prime meridian uh, in, uh, in other cases. We also had a GeoJSON support. Um, it seems like another thing that everybody's using um, in this space is JavaScript. There's just there's such a wealth of libraries out there um, that I I hear people complain about JavaScript all the time, but uh, at the same time everybody's using it. Um, so GeoJSON, we added support for that. So if you're already using JavaScript, it's a nice way to get uh, get uh, ge geometric and geographic uh, data in and out. And we added some some helper features. One of the things that we were missing is, of course, we, we, we didn't have geography support. And so I would always be telling people over the, the last year and a half uh, to, to two years, uh, I'll be going through all the great circle earth calculations. And oh, you can, you know, you can write your own st uh, stored function for Haverson, uh, Haverson and, and so on. Um, so we finally added a st distance sphere function. It's a, it works essentially the same as um, you know, PostGIS has a very similar one. It's very uh, efficient, it's very easy. Basically, it, it pretends the Earth is a, a perfect sphere um, with the diameter is, what is it, 6.37 uh, and change um, million kilometers. Um, and so th if you're dealing with small distances, it's, it's plenty accurate enough. Or if you're, you're dealing with something where there's, you know, lives are not going to be endangered by any lack of precision, if you're just showing somebody how to get to the nearest pizza, pizza shop or whatever, uh, it, it's plenty accurate and it's very quick and efficient. Geography support, uh, we'll talk about uh, in what's coming up next. We also had limited SRID support. 
Um, it's very limited. It's basically just allow, you can specify an SRID for a geometry when you're inserting it. Um, when you select it, you can get that back. Um, and it will prevent you from doing a spatial operation on two geometries that have a different SRID. But that's it. Um, it's really just paving the way for our, our, our full CRS support uh, coming up. And I'll just run through a quick example of, it's really the, the simplest example that, I, that you could generally do. So again, if you're not, if your application isn't generally a spatial application, but you just have uh, some spatial component to it, again, like your bestbuy.com or something, and, and you want to, you have a store locator. You know, show me what the closest store is and what the, um, what the information is. So in this simplest example, you know, we just have, you can assume that all of the points are just WGS84 lon lat coordinate pairs, which makes it really easy. And you can use it with a standard Mercator or Web Mercator projection. So as a starting point, I just took um, the location of an old apartment of mine in New York City. And I wanted to get some Thai food, which happens quite frequently. So I want to know what ones are around me. You know, I, I was well aware with generally what was around me, but in New York, uh, restaurants come and go pretty quickly. So even as, even as somebody who has been in the same neighborhood for quite some time, it could be useful. So to get some data in to play with, I used the OpenStreetMap extract for New York City. And it was a little bit outdated, um, but it worked well enough. And all I did was I modified this OMDB uh, Perl script so that it created the, the table using the NODB storage engine. Uh, we had a added a geometry column and added a spatial index on it. And you can see the final ones here. Now I put my slides up on uh, the session page, if you want to pull those down and then play around with it. And I really hope to, in the future, have uh, something similar to uh, the PGSQL one that they have. And I'll, I'll mention that in the next slide, too. Uh, because the Pro one is a little bit slow, and I don't really like the, the layout, which you can see here, the generated schema. It's a, I'm not too crazy about it. It's not nearly as good as the OSM to PGSQL one. But the, we're going to be looking at the nodes and node tags. So nodes are just uh, points. You know, we can think of them as WGS84 long lat coordinate pairs. And then the node tags table, which is just all the properties or all the metadata for all those points. So you know, it's a restaurant. Uh, it has um, the cuisine is Thai, for example. And then I, because I didn't really, wasn't that crazy about that, I denormalized the tag data so that it more mimics the uh, planet OSM nodes table that gets created by OSM to PGSQL. And I hope that we can work, um, we can work with the uh, OpenStreetMap to create something similar, OSM to MySQL. You know, this is another, uh, an, another result of you know, stagnating in MySQL and the uh, spatial extensions for so long is that we, we don't have, today, we don't have something like OSM to PGSQL for MySQL. So we have the Perl script, but it's not nearly as fast, not ne nearly as nice. So all I did was I just pulled in all the node tags for each uh, location or each uh, point, so that then I, I have uh, key value pairs in this uh, tags text column. So then I'll be able to use, uh, similar to what, if you saw the previous uh, presentation where he's using a, a mixture of a spa uh, spatial relationships and full text searches in the same query, that's what I'm going to do as well. So I added a, we have a spatial index and a full, t full text index. And this was the, I hope the, I don't know if the, I shouldn't have used those colors uh, since it it's might be a little bit hard to see. Um, so this is the, then the, the query that I ended up with. So I'm using the ST distance sphere that, that uses the um, a Haversine um, strategy to calculate the distance between these two geometries on, on the Earth as a circle or a sphere. And then I'm using ST contains, um, and then I'm passing down an envelope. And this this is where you know it's a little it's a bit easier and cleaner when you have projections. So, but uh, we don't have support for projections yet. So what I'm doing here with the 5 divided by 111, 111 is just the average 
distance in kilometers between um, longitude and latitude degrees. And for latitude, it's pretty close. And it's, um, but for longitude, it's not so close because the, you know, it's very wide at the equator and then the closer you get to the poles, eventually they end up touching. Uh, but we don't need it to be too accurate because we're just passing, this is the search box that we're passing down to the spatial index. So basically, you know, New York City has a lot of points. We want to weed out most of them. And so you can just increase it a little bit if you want this, um, the search box to be a bit bigger. But we're actually using the ST distance sphere to, to calculate the end distance. And then I'm using the full text index just to, so I'm searching the tags. And I only want t uh, ones that have uh, a, the word Thai and the word restaurant in it. And then these are the results. You know, hopefully it's a little it's a little hard to see probably because it's a little the colors are a little bleated, but um, we know the name of the place, we know the address, we know the phone number. Um, you can you might have stuff in there for like Yelp ratings or whatever the case may be, and we can see that it's about 600 meters away. So it, again, in our case, we're very. I'm, we're pretending that I'm a very, you know, MySQL a user who just is not necessarily a GIS expert, but has one particular need for their application. And so you, I'm just going to use uh, an, an existing Maps API. In this example, I'm using uh, Google Maps. I'm not even using the API. I'm using a simple uh, get call and just passing in the, telling it, hey, I want the directions from this long lat coordinate pair to this other one. So this just takes them as WGS84 coordinate pairs and then maps out the route for us. Um, of course, then you could, if you could take the next step, if then you want to create your own custom maps and you can use something like HardODB or Mapbox or then, of course, the next step is if you want to have your own map service with GeoServer or something. But for the most basic uh, user, you could use uh, something like Google Maps as I'm doing here. And we can see the the distance was pretty close, it was pretty much right on. The, the walking distance is about half a mile, but uh, remember that we were calculating the distance between two points directly. You know, we were assuming that you could just walk right through all the buildings and everything that are in between. So where we want to go now, uh, as I noted before, we want to provide a, an adequate GIS for people who are already using MySQL, because what we see a lot today are fairly often is that people who are using MySQL exclusively or it's one of their kind of their sanctioned um, database management servers within if it's a big company um, but they have to stand up this one post just instance in order to serve the, the, the limited spatial needs that they have and anytime you add another major piece of software to your IT infrastructure it adds a lot of complexity then you have to have uh, you have to document it. You have to have somebody who understands it, you know, who can manage it, do um, upgrades, performance tuning, um, support, and so on. So we want to be able to, to, to provide a GIS that, that's adequate enough for those basic users. That's the, kind of the immediate goal. And then the, the longer term goal is to be able to, to, to compete with PostGIS in the FOSS market and SQL Server in the commercial market for, and again, for more simple or more common, I should say, use cases. So we're not going to be able to compete with PostGIS anytime soon on features. It's very feature rich, uh, but you, you probably only use a handful, maybe a couple dozen of the functions on a regular basis. And then the, the rest are all kind of once in a blue moon, it'll be really, really helpful but it's something that you can get by without and work around on the rare case that you need it. So that's what I mean by the basic and common use cases, is the, the implementing the, the features and the functions that are most commonly used. I'm um, running low on time, so I'm going to skip through this, uh, this one a little quickly. This is just on the storage side. So 3D support is something that we may have to add to our tree. Post just uses um, Z coordinates for the, the GIST index records for geography. That's, we may have to do that as well, but we'll see. I, we haven't gotten there yet if we're going to need that or not. Of course, we're going to improve the, the underlying storage. This is probably something that isn't too interesting to people. It's kind of, I imagine, most people treat it as a black box. Just give me my data uh, as quickly as you can. 
Um, NUMA machines is another one. I, I saw the post, uh, there, there was a Postgres uh, talk on 9.5, and they were talking about that. So they ran into a lot of the same things that we're seeing, and they're doing a lot of similar work. You know, the, in the coming years, four to eight socket x86 machines are going to be kind of uh, very common, just commodity boxes. So anytime you get that many sockets, you have uh, CPU cache line efficiency and um, lock synchronization primitives. Uh, you have to be able to scale those, so things like RCU and Oh, that's a whole other topic. But uh, that was interesting to see that Post, uh, Postgres had been encountering the same thing, same type of things, and was uh, addressing them in their development release as well. So geography, that's the, probably the single biggest thing that we, that we uh, plan on adding. So with geography types, it, it makes it very simple and easy to calculate distances, um, to do area searches, because everything is in meters by default, so you don't need to worry about any type of dist, you know, um, unit conversions, unless you want to go to miles, but that's easy to do as well. And it's very accurate. So it, it, it uses either um, the Z coordinate, which is just kind of the distance, um, it just, it's more of a Cartesian one, so it's kind of the, just a, the distance from the zero point, which you could think of as the center of the sphere, or geodetics, which can be, get a bit more uh, complex. I'm not sure what we'll end up with in the first release, whether we'll have true geodetic support or it's just going to be a basic Z uh, axis. But that's probably the single biggest one. And remember that PostGIS 1.0 came out and it was about five years later. Uh, that they had 1.5 with geography support. So that's probably the single biggest um, feature. But you need that particularly when, well, one, when accuracy is extremely important, people's lives are at stake. Obviously, you, you don't want to sacrifice um, performance or anything else for accuracy. Also, when you're talking about large distan or long distances, rather. Um, Spatial reference system support, that kind of factors in as well, uh, with geography as well, and, and projections as well, those all kind of all three of those are somewhat related, especially uh, projections and re reference systems. So WGS84 is the most common one. So that's probably where we're going to start, but then we're, uh, we're going to add full uh, CRS uh, support. And projections as well, uh, as, as was noted in the, the post just talk, I think I don't remember if it was the first day or the second day. Um, in many cases, you can, you're better off using geometry objects, and then you can just use uh, transformations. It's not quite as accurate as geography, but it's also much more lightweight. So most, most people, unless you're, talk, unless you're showing someone um, you know, how to get from, uh, let's say, Paris uh, to Moscow, uh, you don't need, you're, you're just fine using, you know, if you're showing someone how to get from uh, one location to another that's you know, one kilometer away, you don't need to use uh, geography. Uh, the also, just things that PostGIS users are more used to, like spatial ref sys and the other standard information schema metadata tables. Those are examples of, of other more smaller things that we plan on doing. But once we have all of these things in place, then we, you know, we'll really be able to kind of enter into the, the conversation with people who are more domain experts, who are really doing more serious um, <coughs> excuse me, geospatial related um, work. And, um, Hopefully this can serve as a springboard to, um, you know, to having myself and, and MySQL as a whole more involved in the Phosphor G space, in the conferences, and in the, the, the development work moving forward. So I just wanted to say thank you um, to, to the chair and the committee that allowed me to come here. Uh, this was really a great learning experience for me. I learned a ton. Um, and I'll be able to share that with the GIS team, and I've been doing that uh, on a daily basis. Um, and thanks for everybody for coming for, uh, and for joining me in th this week. It's really been a, a privilege and an honor to be here. I, 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 I've learned a ton, which I always enjoy, and um, it's, just, it's great to see just the, the wealth and the breadth of the, the free and open source software that there, that there is in this space. That's something that we, we didn't have in the, the database market many years ago. So it's really great to see it now. So then the one space, or the one stack layer that there are a ton of choices is on the database level, layer. Everybody's using PostGIS. 
So hopefully at least there'll be a, another potential alternative. You know, if you're already using MySQL, then you can continue to use it for spatial stuff. Um, any questions? I won't go through the appendix because we're already at the time. Um, but I put the slides up, or a link to them on the, on the session page. And you'll have my contact info in there as, on the first slide if you want to reach out to me with any questions. Go ahead. Um, you mean like the, the what is it, the so geo database? It's one of the many things we've, we've talked about and we've kind of tossed around, like uh, um, being a, providing a, a plug in for their, was it geo database? Um, their RKS Yeah. Um, it is something that we'd like to do. It's, it's not quite as high up on the list as we've got to get the, the good foundation, I think, of geography and projections and CRS support. And then that's, that's just one of the many things that we'd like to, to look at from there. But yeah, we've, we've definitely talked about it. <laughs> I was just curious. And, we'll, and I, would also, I would also like to, to add uh, some QGIS plugins because you can select a lot of different, there, there are plugins even for Oracle Spatial, um, and then I think it defaults to SQL Server, Spatial Lite, and PostGIS. So it would be nice to add a, a plugin there so you can kind of um, work with MySQL as well. So that's, another, that's, prob that, that's something that we would probably do before the ArcGIS support, but we'd like to do both. Um, that's another thing that we would really like to do. I think that's probably the biggest um, basic feature that we would like to do once we get the, the you know, geography projections and CRS. Um, and I think that what I would like to do is, is figure out, and I, I was talking with the GIS team about this, is figure out how we can leverage um, OSRM, so the open source routing machine. Um, and this, we can do that because it, they changed their license from AGPL uh, to a BSD style license. So that's, that's an option for us now that uh, I definitely want to explore. And that if we're able to leverage it, um, then that actually could be something that we, get, we end up doing it around the same time as the, the geography support. So the full um, spatial features will be available in the free version, eh? There won't be any differentiation Yep. No, there, really, the this, the enterprise uh, add-ons we've done. Most of them are outside of the server, like enterprise backup is a separate product, and enterprise monitor. There are some plugins we've done, but it's we've tried to limit that to, to things that are generally of more interest to like you know Fortune 500 companies or something like you know. Um, HIPAA compliant auditing and, and things like that. But none of the spatial stuff is going to be uh, enterprise or commercial only. It's, and and that's, that's true for 99.999% of the stuff. Um, we just we try to reserve some stuff for the commercial so that we get uh, money to, to fund the development and to help me pay my mortgage and all that kind of stuff. Well, wasn't it that way with Oracle Spatial at one time? I don't know if it's still there. I don't know. I'm not sure, but I know with uh, Oracle, it's <coughs> they have all kinds of uh, it's it's kind of a you know a pack like they call it. So Oracle um, Spatial and Graph, you can download it. You can download it uh, from um, edelivery.oracle.com, um, but then it, it's it's a, it's a separate fee even beyond what the basic uh, Oracle license prices are. So if you're already using Oracle and money is not an issue, I mean, Oracle is still kind of the, I guess the gold standard, I mean, that's debatable, but uh, if you've got the money, but you're gonna need a lot of money. <laughs> um, and then Oracle Spatial and Graph is, is obviously an option. All right, thanks again, everybody.